Uh, it's so good to make much of Jesus, and uh, this is my favorite day to preach, and I can promise you it'll be a shorter sermon from me. That's saying a lot for those of you who have been here a while. Uh, we are here today to make much of Jesus, so happy Easter. It's good. Welcome to the best day. I call this the best day of the year. And if a preacher can't preach on Easter Sunday, they shouldn't be a preacher. Uh, Jesus is alive, and I've got good news from the graveyard today. Jesus Christ, he is alive. He's defeated death. He's conquered the grave, and he's, get this, forgiven sin, opened up heaven. Is that good? Amen? Amen. In the last few years, oh man, it's been a lot of bad news, right? It's been a heavy season, but today we got good news. The last few years, a spirit has gripped this planet of fear. There's this spirit of fear that has gone throughout. Everybody's just afraid to die. Every day we got a death count, right? Remember those days where it was just given to us, a death count. We shut down our nations. We shut down our cities. We shut down our businesses. We shut down even the church because people didn't want to die. That's where we're at. People don't want to die. Congratulations, you've made it so far. Right? Like if you're here, sitting here, that's a good sign. You've made it, but I have bad news. You're still going to die. We're all going to die. But the good news, and only Christianity tells us this, that the cause of death, what the cause of death is, and then Christianity tells us what, what, what the cure is. So the cause of death is sin. That's why we're in a broken world. That's why people are dying. That's why people are battling many things. But the cure for death is Jesus. And that's why we're gathered as we zero in today on this fact that Jesus is the cure for death. Sin against God brings death. That's what it brings. Jesus is our God. He comes. He dies for our sin. He goes through the grave and then he comes back three days later. That's why we're here today. That's why we gather every Sunday. Because Jesus conquered the grave. Like if Jesus did not conquer the grave, I would say, let's leave and eat. <laughs> like why be here to go through a religious routine? No, Jesus is alive. That's why we gather. Yeah, you can get excited. It's all good. This is how our sins are forgiven, right? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about that today. Could you imagine showing up on Easter Sunday and not having a message on the resurrection of Jesus? We're going to talk about how Jesus conquered the grave, because that's how our sins are forgiven. That's how our eternity is secured. This is how our death is defeated. If you're in Christ, you don't have to fear. You don't have to walk around with fear. What we're talking about is resurrection, and here's what that is. Somebody's alive, they die for a while, they come back, but they never die again. That's where we're going. This is different than, for example, uh, near-death experience. Like, I, I, I died and I saw a light and, you know, I saw Elvis and then I, then I came back. Or I saw a light and I saw Jesus and now I'm back. Like, we're talking about something totally different. Because this isn't just coming back and having an experience. Because the reality is you'll die again. Jesus never died again. He rose from the grave. This is different. This is living, dying, to never die again. And the only person to accomplish that is Jesus. He's the only one. And after Jesus rose from the grave, get this, for 40 amazing days after he rose from the grave, he walked with his disciples. 
He walked once again. People saw, and this is even outside of the Bible, there's history that records this, that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, was with us for 40 amazing days, appeared to his disciples on many occasions, taught them concerning the kingdom of God, and then he ascends back into the clouds. He returns to the Father in heaven. He is alive. Okay, so 40 amazing days, and then all of a sudden Jesus ascend, ascends back to heaven. This is now 10 days later I want to take us to. The disciples, after that event, are huddled in an upper room. So think about this. It's about a crowd like this, right? A little more. But they're huddled in an upper room. They're waiting. They're praying. They're watching. They're wondering, like, what happens next? Because Jesus said, it's better for me to what? Go. Because Jesus is going to give us something that will satisfy all of life. He's going to give us something called the Holy Spirit that indwells us at the moment we come to know Christ. So on the day of Pentecost, this is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, the answer to what Jesus said would happen comes in the form of strange languages, a mighty rushing wind, and tongues of fire. And at length, Peter stood to explain all of this to a crowd of baffled onlookers. So what did it all mean? Like, when you read that account, were these men drunk with wine? No, they weren't. They were filled, this is what we call filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter began to preach the gospel. He preaches the gospel. He reminded the hearers that with the wicked hands that they had crucified Jesus. And then he reminds them, this is not the end of the story, right? We end it Friday with that message. It's not the end. There's more to the story. And on Sunday morning, something unbelievable happened. Jesus rose from the grave. He rose from the dead. And this is how Peter explained it to his transfixed audience. Here it is, Acts 2.24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible. Get that. Underline it. Highlight it. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. This is the first public statement by any Christian regarding what happened that first Sunday morning when the women found the empty tomb. Here it is. God raised him from the dead. Simple statement of fact. Freeing him from the agony of death. What the resurrection meant for Jesus. And then, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's the reason Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, looking back, it just seems inevitable to Peter, only 50 days ago, that he and the other disciples were what? What were they doing? They were cowering behind closed doors. They were lost. They were broken. They were overcome by grief and fear after the horrific events of Good Friday. And the last thing, the last thing they expected was a resurrection. Even though Jesus said it over and over, the last thing they expected was a resurrection. Even the women who came to the tomb were coming to anoint a dead body. They had no thought of finding the tomb empty, and when they found it empty, here's what they assume. Someone must have what? Taken the body. What a difference a day makes. What a difference a day makes. Having seen Jesus up close and personal, Peter knew that he had what? Risen from the dead. The impossible had happened. A dead man came back to life. The Son of God had broken the power of death. The grave church had been defeated. And now everything was clear in his mind. He had to rise. It was going to happen. Amazing. It's amazing. And Peter's going, I don't know why I couldn't see it sooner. The only word he has is impossible. Not impossible for Jesus to rise, but impossible for Jesus not to rise. This is how he describes it. And as we think about that and ponder the remarkable transformation, consider a statement that we often hear at funerals. If you've been to any funeral, you normally hear ashes to ashes, 
dust to dust. We've heard it so often that it almost seems cliche. The phrase brings us back to God's judgment on Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. From dust to dust, from dirt to dirt, from the earth to the earth. This is a destiny of all people, and we rise from the dust, right? And many of us, we live 20, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, but we go where? Back to the dirt, back to dust. And with that in mind, don't make this life about you. That's where we're heading, right? We're heading back to dust. Now follow, because it only gets better. All of life, if you think about it, when you go to a graveyard, you see the date you're born, right, someone's born, and the dash, and then the date that they passed away. And that dash is so significant because that dash signifies life. And if you think about it, our life is that dash. It's only small. We're only here for a little while. And I need you to think about this. See, we're going back to the dust, but Jesus, he didn't. He rose from the grave. He did not go back to dust. Though he died, his body was not decaying in the grave. He was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. That's Acts 2.31. He died as the sin bearer. Think about this. On the cross, Jesus carries all the sin, the weight of sin on his shoulders. He dies as the sin bearer. So all your past sin, your present sin, your future sin, he carries that. And when we live in defeat and when we live in, in a way lost in our sin, we got to see the cross. And we got to see what Jesus did there, how he carried, how he bared the burden of sin for us. And because he had no sin in himself, in himself, his body did not decay in the grave. But why was it impossible that death could not hold him? Think about that. Why was it impossible that death could not hold him? Perhaps it's a statement about his power. Jesus at one point said he had the power to lay down his life and the power to take it back up again. John 10, 17 and 18. But the resurrection was more than a demonstration of his divine power. Perhaps it's a statement about his power. Jesus at one point said he had the power to lay down his life and, and to take it back up again. But it's also a statement about the power of God the Father. Logic demands that the Father not leave his son in the grave forever. Certainly the resurrection proves that the power God has is over the realm even of death, but Peter's statement goes beyond it. Perhaps it refers to the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Peter even quotes Psalm chapter 16 as a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus, but the impossibility to which Peter refers even goes beyond prophecy. And perhaps it refers to the moral necessity of just vindicating the words of Jesus. He said over and over again that he would rise from the dead. He told his disciples that he would be betrayed, that he would be tried, mistreated, crucified, and that on the third day he would rise from the dead. Even if they never got it, he still said it and he told them many times. If he didn't rise from the dead, then he is not the truth. Jesus even declares himself, I am the truth. So if he did not rise from the grave, he would not be the truth. John 14, 6, he claims it, and his words could not be trusted if that was the case. No doubt this involved in, was involved in his resurrection, but even that is not the end of the story. I think the most important factor can actually be made in a statement Peter, uh, found in a statement Peter makes, Acts 3.15, when he tells the men of Jerusalem, he says to them, you've killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So ponder this phrase with me, prince of life, prince of life. 
Other versions say the author of life. So hear me today. Jesus is the source of life. He's the source of life. He's the Lord of life. He's the Prince of life. He is life incarnate. Life itself comes from him. And apart from him, there is no life at all. If that be true, why then did Jesus die in the first place? He died to save us. He dies to save us. Death was necessary. It had to happen to pray, pay the price for our sin, but death could not hold him forever. For death could not hold him forever. He conquers it. Death is a powerful enemy, foe, but life is supreme. Death wins many battles, right? Like we go to funeral after funeral, and I stand up and I officiate funerals, and I look over and I see, right, either the urn or I see the casket, and when the verse says, oh, death, where is your sting? I go, there's the sting of death. It's, it's right there. And when I do a funeral, I stand there and I think about it. And I'm like, the, the casket is there. The person is there. Like, death is real. It happens. But it's not supreme. It may win some battles. But hear me, the prince of life wins in the end. Especially here, you need to hear this and hold to it if you're a Christ follower. Like, we've made, I, I get people mourning and I get people grieving over loss. But if you are a Christian and you are, you know, it's your funeral, you have died, that should be a celebration. And, and, I, and I've told people close to me, I said, when, whenever it's my funeral, make sure it's more like a party. Like, I, I get tears, I get grieving, right? Like, I can't go to my mom and say, don't cry. She's going to if anything happened. But what I'm trying to get the point across to us is that this moment, when we leave this earth and we go to reign with Jesus, that's what we've been longing for. That's what we've been hoping for. Because the life that Christ gives, it conquers death. It is good to ask ourselves how Jesus rose from the dead. See, it was impossible for death to hold him, for death cannot defeat life in the end. Jesus is the life. Life always wins because the Prince of Life, he won the battle 2,000 years ago. And Jesus is declaring this. It's good to ask ourselves, though, how did he rise from the dead? The actual act of resurrection, it was hidden from human eyes. The means by which God raised the sun are beyond human understanding. But this much we know. They took Jesus' body off the cross. And when they took his body down from the cross, they wrapped it carefully with strips of linen interspersed with 75 to 125 pounds of spices and resins. Those spices and that gummy resins formed a tight bond with the linen cloth so that it eventually became a hard encasement around the dead body that protected it from potential grave robbers because it made it extremely difficult to remove the, the linen wrapping. Then they took the body, placed it in a tomb, and then an enormous stone was rolled in front of the entrance. Later, Pilate had the tomb sealed and posted soldiers at the entrance. The only other fact we know is that the body of Jesus, though dead, did not suffer any way where it decomposed. Sometime before dawn on Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. From John's description, it seems as if he passed right through the linen. He passed through those wrappings without disturbing them. I say that because John reports that he and Peter looked inside the tomb, saw the wrappings in the same place where they had been on Friday evening, almost like a cocoon after the butterfly has emerged. In John 20, verses 3 to 9, Jesus simply slipped away from his grave clothes once and for all. He arose from the dead. He's healthy. He's uh, vigorous. He's bearing the scars of his suffering. Yet he's in a glorified human body. What does this mean for us today? Will Jesus give 
gave us the answer to the question right before his crucifixion. John 14, 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. How simple. How clear. How profound those words are. Center point. The world is filled with pain. Let not your heart be troubled. Your life is filled with trial. Let not your heart be troubled. There is sadness on every hand. Let not your heart be troubled. We all have questions we can't answer. Let not your heart be troubled. What will the future hold? Let not your heart be troubled. There is so much sickness. Let not your heart be troubled. We watch war. It unfolds in Ukraine. Let not your heart be troubled. We're all going to die. It's going to happen someday. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. I've done a few funerals as a pastor. And when I do a Christian's funeral and then I go to the graveside, I always take a moment and I step back at this time and I watch it because to me it's so powerful. But right as I'm ending a graveside uh, service, I'll pray and I'll make the statement right from, uh, from dirt, dirt to dirt and then uh, the director or whoever's overseeing that funeral, he will take dirt, he'll put it on the casket uh, in the shape of a cross and he does that and I close in prayer and then I walk, I walk over away because at this time the family, the friends are going to gather around the casket and this is the moment that I just watch and I cherish it. Because at this moment, for most funerals, they take flowers and they start to place them on the casket. And sometimes you might wonder, like, why do we do certain things we do at events, right? And at a funeral, as those flowers are being placed on a casket, it's actually symbolic. Symbolic of life. So, we acknowledge that we die and we go back to the dust but then flowers are placed on, the casket is laid in, and for a Christian funeral, this is where there's so much hope. Because there's life. Yeah, we die an earthly death, but we live forever with Jesus. That's life. And as those flowers are placed, I remember the most famous verse in Scripture, right? For God so loved the world. That he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. It's deeply moving to me as I watch the family gather around. And there's tears, there's hugging, but for the Christian, there's hope. And we shed our tears and we say our goodbyes here on this earth, but there's hope. That if a person is found in Jesus, they reign with Jesus. Like, I have loved ones who I've lost. Some have known Jesus, some have not. The ones where they don't know Christ, those are hard. Those are hard. The ones where they do, it's hard, but it's with hope. Like, I have loved ones someday that I will see again because of the hope of Jesus. Because of the hope that's found in Jesus. Literally, now, since flowers bloom from the earth, life comes forth from death. Now get this. Holy Week ends in a resurrection. It ends in a resurrection. But yesterday, it was Saturday, what we call Holy Saturday, the day of preparation that comes between Good Friday and Easter. And the message of Saturday for the Christian is get ready. So yesterday was get ready, something's about to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. The problem is, Saturday seems so long in moments like this. It feels like Sunday will never get here. But I checked it out. Sunday arrives. Here we are today. 
Yesterday was Saturday, but Sunday's here. It's coming, and here we are. So on Saturday, what do we do? We hope. We place our hope in Christ because we're moving towards Easter. So we end it Friday by saying Sunday's coming. And here we are. We, we focus on this. Jesus rose from the grave. All we got to do is hold on a little while longer. And Sunday will soon be here. So follow me now. Life right now feels like Saturday. And some of us, all we can do is hold on. Keep holding on. Oh, Howie, you don't understand. My life's so difficult. My life's so hard. I have so much going on. Hold on. Hold on. It's Saturday, but Sunday's coming. See, for the Christian, we have a promise. Yeah, it feels like Saturday as we walk through this life, but we have the promise that someday our Savior, our Jesus, will break through the clouds. It's coming. He's going to return, and he's going to break through those clouds. Keep holding on. Keep holding on. Don't let go, church. There's hope. Death will not have the last word. In Jesus, we have hope. In Jesus, we know hope. It's not just wishful thinking. It's just not sentimental hoping. On what basis do we believe that we will see this hope fulfilled? I'll tell you, all around us, there is death. More death. Death surrounds us. Death still is reigning in the world. It's been a long time since anyone's seen a resurrection. Everything we see with our eyes argues against it. But faith in Christ triumphs in the end. It does. It triumphs in the end. We do not believe in the resurrection of the saints because of what we see with our eyes. We believe in the resurrection of the saints because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's true Christianity. That's right there in Scripture. That Jesus rose from the grave. And because he did that, I hope. Because he did what you and I could not do. He carried sin, paid the cost, and then he offers it to us. And when we have it, it changes everything. It changes everything. Listen to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. If we believe. So the question is, do you believe that Jesus rose again? That'll change everything if you say, well, I do. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. That's all you have to believe. But that's not the whole ball game from God's point of view. That's... I'm going to push the gospel to a point where sometimes we forget. Yeah, you come to Jesus, your life has changed, but someday he returns. He fulfills his promise. And when he returns, he takes you home. We, we go, here's the gospel, confess sin, come to Jesus, and I'm here to tell you that's awesome, that's great, but let's bring it to the end. Come to Jesus now if you don't know him. Repent of sin, turn from sin, embrace Jesus, but now live with hope. Hope that, yeah, he's coming. I guarantee it. Jesus has not broken a promise. He will come again. If God raised his own son from the dead, he will not leave in the grave those who believe in Jesus while they were alive. He will return. They will be raised because he rose. We too will rise because he lives. We too will live. 
There's good news from the graveyard this morning. Good news. The tomb is empty. Good news. Jesus rose from the dead. Good news. The devil couldn't hold him. Good news. The death has lost its sting. Good news that the grave has lost its victory. Good news that we do not have to fear death anymore. And as far as I know, my heart this morning, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. Not because I'm especially brave. Oh, I'm not. Sometimes I flick off the light and I wonder what's coming. <laughs> but I do know what's on the other side. I do know what awaits me on the other side. My Jesus has come back and he told me what I can expect. And I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fear it. I'm now standing with the risen king. Oh, this is beautiful. Staring at an empty tomb today. Because Jesus, you are living proof. You're living proof. There is nothing that he cannot do. Listen, church. If you hear that I've died tonight... When they bury me, someone please do this. Stick up a sign that says temporary residence. Like, for real, you can have fun, do, do it. Like, I'm coming back up someday when Jesus returns. You can count on it. I say that without any sense of pride or boasting because my confidence is in Jesus. It's in his work, what he's done. Not in what I've done. Oh, I'm a mess. But he has done great things. And that's our hope. It's found in him. For my resurrection does not depend on me. It does not depend on my good deeds. It does not depend on any merit in me at all. It depends solely and wholly on my Lord Jesus Christ who raised, who rose from the dead this Easter Sunday morning. This is why we gather and celebrate. He promised that if we would trust in him, someday we would rise with him. And church, I've staked my entire life on that promise. Like, if it's not true, I have nothing else for you. This is what I stake my life on. That my Savior is alive. That my Savior will return. And I know it's true. I've read it in his word. I've seen it come true in life in glimpses. Where there were, I'll just be honest, it was scenes of death. Where it looked like, what will God do now? And God shows up and through his son Jesus, he provides resurrection. From the ashes that crumble in life, he builds up something even better. And some of us, we're walking through things and it's broken. It feels like our world's crumbled. But hear me, because of the resurrection, Jesus rebuilds. Because of the resurrection, you have redemption and he redeems. So that brokenness that you're experiencing, you have a promise of resurrection life. That even now, as you walk through the pain and the brokenness, your Savior is putting the pieces back together again, church. That you have hope, even in this life. Just not future hope, but right now. That even now, Jesus is providing resurrection. I've had areas in my life where I thought, okay, God, I'm broken. I'm done. I don't know what to do. And he just shows up and says, watch this. Watch it. I'm not finished with you. There's still hope. There's still purpose. Like God has a plan for you. You need to hear that. Too many in our world are losing hope. They're losing hope. They're taking their life. Suicide at an all-time high. What ultimately heads people down that road is a loss of hope. But we got hope. It's Jesus. He's our hope. It's so true. Like, I don't plan on staying dead forever. Like, if I die tonight, no, no. I know I'll be with Jesus right away, but someday that body will come out of the grave, and it's good news from the graveyard, and it's a strange place for good news, but that's what Easter is all about. If you're looking for Jesus today, don't look in the graveyard. He isn't there. He left it 2,000 years ago. He never went back. The really good news is this. 
What is buried, Jesus can raise again. What is lifeless, he'll breathe life within. What seems over to you, it's not the end. There is nothing that Jesus cannot do. And out of darkness, he's brought victory. He's torn the veil away for us. Like you and I have access to God. I am so grateful that you don't have to come to me to tell me all your sin. You can just go right to Jesus. He's your, he's your guy. He's the one you should be consulting often. He's, he's the savior. He changes you. The one who empties graves is here to do the same. And I'm just here to tell you, let dead things come back to life. So if you're looking for Jesus today, you can meet him right now. In fact, I want to introduce him to you. And we'll end here today. But his name, who I'm introducing you to, is the name I've used probably a hundred, hundred times today. His name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Son of God. He came, from earth, he came from heaven to earth. God so loved you that he sent Jesus to die on a cross for you. He was buried in Joseph's tomb. He rose from the grave on Easter Sunday morning. He paid for your sins so that if you believe in him, the Bible says you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. Are you trusting the one who rose from the dead? See, Jesus, he is alive. He's standing with open arms. He's inviting you to accept this offer of eternal life. The door of heaven is wide open. I invite you, take that step of faith. You might go, I, I don't really believe in Jesus. Take the step of faith and you will see he's alive. You will see that he'll come into your mess, your brokenness, your pain, your sickness, your struggles, and he will be a solid foundation that you can stand on. You will see that. I guarantee that. I do not promise that he'll take all the pain away or all the brokenness away, but I will promise you he will be the most solid foundation you have ever stood on in your life through the pain through the brokenness through the world crumbling down around you he will be the one who steadies you he will be the one who leads you through the storm he leads you through the valley that's what I'll promise you that's what I'll guarantee you is that Jesus will be the most solid thing you stand on for the rest of your life And all it takes, church, is a step. A step. Are you tired? All these other things aren't working. Money, stuff, relationship. It's not working. They're lousy saviors. They can't save you. Popularity, entertainment, Netflix. Lousy, lousy saviors. There is only one savior. And when you step on that foundation, it changes you forever. It does, church. Like, oh, it's hard. It's so hard, but Jesus, you're holding me. It's so tough. This pain I'm experiencing, it's, it's so rough. I understand. I understand you. I relate to you. I know you. I've created you. There is no accident that you're here. It says in the Bible, before the foundations of the world, he knew you. Like, let that sink in. He, he knew you. He created you. He knows you so well. I extend to you today a personal invitation to consider becoming a Christ follower. Like if your soul is hungry for something more than you found, I'm here to tell you, try Jesus. Try Jesus. And I will guarantee you, he will not fail you. He won't.
If Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, open the door. I get it, right? If someone knocks on my door sometimes, I'm like, quiet. <laughs> this is the day we're in. In the 80s, we ran to the door. Now, we're like, turn off the lights. Duck. Get out of the window. What are you doing? Get down on the floor. The door. Someone's knocking on it. But if it's Jesus, run to that door. Flick on the light and say, come in. He wants to. He's going to change your life. And my theology would be, he's, he's kicking down the door. And he's coming in. He's going to change you. He's going to change you. Each of us. We have an appointment with death sooner or later. But for the Christian, that's a cause for rejoicing. Not for fear. Provided that our trust is in Jesus, rejoice. And here's the final proof that death has been dis destroyed. When Jesus rose from the dead, he left the tomb wide open. Love it. The tomb is wide open. That means we won't have to fight our way out of the grave when he calls us to wake up. He left the door open 2,000 years ago. That is God's guarantee that even though we die, we won't stay dead forever. One final word. Jesus died on the cross. It's your move now. He died on the cross. It's your move now. What are you going to do? Jesus rose from the dead. It's your move now. God has answered our deepest questions with the simplicity of the empty tomb. It's your move now. On this Easter morning, I declare to you, right now, as I've done all morning, Jesus is alive. He's alive. My friends, what will he say to that? What difference does it make to you? Will you give him your heart? Will you give him your life? Will you trust him as your Lord and Savior? And hear me, it's your move now. I've done what I've been called to do. Declare the glorious gospel. Jesus died for our sin. He was buried. And today we celebrate. He rose again. I've done my job. It's your move now. Do you know Christ today? If you don't, I want to give you the opportunity. So let's bow our heads. I'll invite our worship team up. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus, hear me on this. A prayer doesn't save you. It's faith in Christ. It's by his grace. It says that in scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith, that none of yourselves. Okay? This is all Jesus. This is us placing our faith and our trust in Jesus. I don't know where you are today, but I do know the Bible says that it's good to confess. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, hear me. This is a divine appointment. God brought you here because he wants to introduce you to Jesus, his son, who he gave for you. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there is nothing that we could do to earn that salvation. That is why God sent Jesus. And Jesus did what we couldn't do. Jesus lived the perfect life. He carried sin on the cross. He died for it. And the empty grave proves that he's the only way. He's the only person who rose and lives today. So if you're here and you do not know him, all you got to do is by faith say, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I know that I am lost in my sin. But I know through the empty grave, you provided hope. And I place my trust in what you have done on the cross. And I look at the empty tomb and I place my trust in what you have done in conquering death. And now I want to live my life for you. I place my life onto that solid foundation. God, I pray. If there's anyone in the room today who's just struggling through life and they know you as Savior, let this be a fuel up that there is hope, a reminder that there's a better day coming. 
that someday our Jesus will break through the clouds and someday those of us who are found in Jesus will reign with him forever. Let us look to that future hope, but as we live in the present, let us know that you're with us, God, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our relational pain, in the midst of our financial struggles, in the midst of our sicknesses. God, you are there. Not only that, you have spoken hope. So God, I pray for the Christian that they would cast all their cares, all their fears, all their anxieties on you because you care for them. Pray this in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen.